to show you is when, I think, when I'm a plant pathologist and I'm thinking about what's going to happen in the upcoming year, I almost think of a race. And a lot of times the goal of your race is always to either finish first or get your participation ribbon, which was my, my cup of tea for a long time. But really it's no different. What we're trying to do is we're trying to stay ahead of the type of disease that we face. We have a variety of diseases on wheat and a lot of them can, can affect at different times of the year. Um, and I'm going to go through these a little bit more more concise as we move through, but just to kind of remember is when I think of prevention, which is often our best mode of preventing disease uh, affecting our crops, think of it of always trying to stay ahead of the ball game. A lot easier said than done, I realize that. So the first types of categories I'm going to look at is we have vert rots of wheat. Now I'm not going to give you a lot of a disease identification, but I'm really going to be focused on the management and some kind of take home messages. So with vert rots and wheat, we have three major ones. We have common vert rot, Fusarium crown rot, and we have take all. And all these can be found more or less to the extent, depending on what area of the state you are. Uh, as of late, there's been more Fusarium crown rot, and they're probably present every year. You may not notice it, sometimes you really do notice it. it it's really sporadic. That's what we deal with with root rise. Uh, they're more problematic when the crop is stressed, so you think of drought environments, maybe too much water. Um, all those can come into play for planting into really cool soils. Uh, and uh, it takes a while for the crop to emerge, that's when you might see some of this infection. And they often occur as a complex. And what I mean by complex is you may just not have Fusarium crown rot, you may have common root rot, or vice versa with some of these others. So that's something you have to keep in mind is when it comes to anything that's living in the soil, it's really difficult to see what's underneath there, right? We, we, don't, we don't have that, where we put the seed in the ground, we don't have those type of assays to help with it. The type of symptoms that we see here are some uh, seed treatment plots that we did at the Fargo campus. Uh, can, we, can, we, uh, can we turn the lights down just a little bit? The, I know it's going to get dark and a lot of you are going to have to try to look at those clickers. But uh, some of the first things you notice is some apparent stand loss. So like in this photo, you can see this was a trial with no seed treatment. It was just inoculated with the pathogen. There is, there is some stand loss uh, type of things they may see early on. That, that's probably the one thing when people think of vert rot, you think of stand loss. But we also have some later season type of symptoms. Um, here you see all these white heads in the field. Somebody may think it's wheat stem maggot, right? Somebody may think it's Brazilian head blight, or maybe some type of uh, spray contamination. But in this case, it's root rot. And the key thing about root rot, yes, they may, may be more problematic early on, but these things don't go away in the soil. A lot of times with Fusarium crown rot, you may not see it till later, and then at that point, there's no seed treatment out there that has enough residual to take care of it. Uh, so just kind of remember is that when you, when you see something at this end of the season, really uh, take some time to identify it first before you just come into some of your conclusions. Uh, if you would pull up these roots, the ones that, uh, in this case, that's what I pulled out, out of one of my plots, you really have a discolored root system. It may be brown or blackish, depends if it's common root rot. For Xerium crown rot, if you go right above the soil surface, you may see more of a reddish uh, type of color. Uh, that, those are all something that's discolored, something that just doesn't look like the rest of the healthy plants in the field when it, when it comes to the lower vascular system. Okay, so that was root rot. Just going to introduce it. We're going to talk about management a little bit. I want to talk about another category of diseases we face, virus diseases. Uh, when you think of small grains, in North Dakota we have a couple different virus diseases. Uh, probably the yellow dwarf virus is one, it's an aphid vector, but probably the most important virus disease is wheat streak mosaic virus. With virus, there's always something else at play, a vector. And in this case, it's a wheat curl mite. Tiny, you can't see it, and it's you know, something that's maybe out there. Um, some typical symptoms we see, yellowing and stunting, uh, you have streaking of the, uh, of the apparel to the veins, gives that mosaic appearance. And because this is vectored by a biological organism, you may see it in patches. You may be seen starting on a field edge and moving across the field with, with the wind currents. These don't have winds, uh, they don't have wings, so they are dependent on some of, these, some of the winds to help blow it across the field. They overwinter in the crown of perennial grasses and also winter wheat. So, Really, when I just mentioned where, this, where the vector is overwintering, you probably start thinking about some of the management, management things we could talk about. And multiple grass species are host. Uh, certainly all your major cereal crops can be host, and wheat seems to be is the most susceptible when it comes to this virus. Uh, here's just a photo uh, that Roger gave me a couple years ago. Uh, you're really looking at it from leading from a field edge. You start to see a little bit of yellowing moving across the field, and certainly it's uh, more severe about where the photo was taken to when you move across. 
If you blow up those plants, you see that streaking, uh, stunting, and all that really comes into play is the sooner that you start seeing that, probably the more expectation of yield loss is going to occur, right? Because that virus is starting to replicate within that host tissue, and you're going to see some problems. That's virus diseases. We also have foyer diseases. Yes, I know, it seems like I'm giving you like a doomsday talk of all these types of problems in the upcoming year, but there is going to be some, some optimistic knowledge here in, in a little bit. We also, uh, the foyer diseases that were most common, tan spotters are, as for like the last 15 years, was the most common wheat disease we have in North Dakota. It's a foyer disease, it is a residue borne disease. Uh, so certainly in wheat on wheat and no-till ground is where you have a better chance of seeing this disease and likely dealing with it on an every year basis. We also have rust diseases. Now this is a little bit different. They don't overwinter in this state, especially for, for the wheat rust. We have leaf rust and stripe rust. As the name implies, leaf rust uh, is, is what you think of what, what you find like the rust on your car. Uh, it's, it's more brown, red, oval lesion. Stripe rust, also known as yellow rust, appears in linear stripes, yellowing. This is a, kind of the simple things you can identify. But the key thing to remember is they're blowing in from the south. Really, we don't see these until the crop is a little bit further along because we're dependent on our neighbors in the south to, to receive these spores that are blowing up. Every year, you can think of in May, uh, you can always find at least one storm that starts above Nebraska, maybe down into Kansas, that it moves straight north. And because of that, everybody thinks of it, oh, we're getting rain. But in my time, I'm like, wait, I'm not almost like predicting, when am I going to see my first rust phone call? What should I do? Because that, that is how these spores travel. So that's something else to keep in mind that really, in this case, crop rotation won't be having anything to do with it. Finally, with head diseases, uh, uh, we have fusarium head bite, scab, very devastating disease. We also have uh, loose smut. There are other head diseases out there, but ones that I deal with on a more frequent basis are these two. Um, so, given those categories that I, just get, that I just presented, here comes your clicker responses again. So I, I brought those down in the root rods, foliar diseases, viruses, and head diseases. I want to know what the audience is dealing with. What do you manage or farm? What type of diseases are you dealing with on an every year basis? Uh, uh, look at your selections and go ahead and respond at any time. I'll give you a few more seconds here before we see. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll cut it off here. <laughs> So this is kind of what I expected. What is, what is kind of the overwhelming majority of what we deal with on an every year basis? Several of them, right? There's, not, there's usually not one disease that you're worried about or one disease you deal with. You're de dealing with a bunch of diseases. Because that you know that, which I'm excited to hear, that kind of helps, helps gear with the message that we're going to be learning about today. And that is about disease management. So what do we think of disease management when we're facing several diseases, maybe a few select diseases? Well. Uh, going back to a popular topic is what type of tools do we have available to us? What can we use to manage it? Well, right away we have, from right when you select what variety you plant. Uh, depending on the variety, they're going to be either more susceptible or maybe more resistant to some of the diseases that we have in North Dakota. We also have some of your cultural practices. One of our biggest key things we have in the state of North Dakota is crop rotation. Crop rotation has an influence on in how you manage your farm, but at the same time, it has an influence on disease as well. Uh, we also have some other cultural practices, planting dates, right? Um, those can have an impact on some of the diseases that were mentioned previously. And finally, we always have that one thing called fungicides. And that's where I've been probably spending a lot of time because this is one of the more popular questions and most of my research has been based on is some of the fung fungicides that, we, that uh, we have to spray on some of these crops. So starting with variety, selection, and seed source. How does this impact and how we can prevent diseases in the upcoming year? So the first question I need to get a feel about is, when you select that variety, and I'm not here to harp on, no, this is, I just want to know what, you, what everybody is doing out here. Is what, I know aside from yield being an important reason, what is the second most important reason? Is it disease resistance, insect resistance, maybe it's height, maybe availability of seed, or other? Go ahead and uh, start responding at any time. Okay. I'll let this fill up here. 
more seconds. Okay, it looks like a standstill. Oh! Wow, you guys are making me happy all of a sudden. I didn't expect that. Disease resistance. Okay, that's a great thing to remember. Uh, there are some other things, some other availability of seed and height. And when it comes to that variety, I know there's a lot of decisions that go into it. But one thing never to forget about is what type of disease resistance is in that variety. Because that's going to influence um, potential some of the inputs you may have to, to look at in the, in the season. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind is when you select that variety, have it like that background profile. My joke always is treat it like an online dating site. Almost try to get all as much history as you can about that variety and know what may or may not happen in the upcoming season. So when I look at, at varieties, this is how I compare it as a plant pathologist. So what I did is I uh, collected data, uh, I used data that was generated uh, based off the Wheat Commission and some of the stat service where we look at what are the most common hardwood spring wheat varieties grown in the state, and I have listed those on the far left-hand column. Out here is Barlow, Elgin, Prosper, Soren, Velva, and Glen. And what I just want to use is to start focusing on the types of diseases and how they perform against them. So looking at your foliar diseases, of leaf rust, stripe rust, and leaf spot, notice there is some variability in that, right? And depending on what variety you select may influence on, okay, what type of foliar diseases may I see this year? What, 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 should, I do, what should I be thinking about when this, is, when, when this is starting to emerge and the leaves are starting to come up? More importantly, maybe, is what is the vulnerability to head scab? When you think of head scab and the varieties we have in small grains, there's nothing immune out there, okay? They're, they're, we're not there yet. But we do have varieties that are definitely more resistant than others. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind. With the hard red spring rates, we have more resistance built in than to your Durham, for example, and your winter reeds. So when you, when you think of variety selection, this is the type of stuff that is good to know. It's great to know as far as how it's going to perform just with the host itself. Another way to look at it is I can always tell you these ratings of moderate resistance, moderate and susceptible, but what does this look like? So this, this is what I'm going to show you three photos. And this is of a stripe rust plot that we had this past year. And this was noticed on the east side, we had a stripe rust epidemic. And what we were able to do is score some of these varieties and how they performed in a high disease environment. So moving left to right here is what we consider to be a susceptible response. Notice the yellowing, a lot of pustules are starting to form. In the middle here is, you may be some of the yellowing, but notice how those pustules aren't coming through? That's, that's that plant trying to prevent that pathogen from multiplying, from reproducing and infecting more plants. We consider that to be a mildly susceptible, mildly resistant, somewhere in that category. And finally, this is what we call the resistant reaction. Okay, so well, when you think of those words, you know, mildly resistant, mildly susceptible, we just don't pull them out of a hat. This is what we're looking at on an every, every year basis when we get the chance. This is just not for foliar diseases, think of it with those head scab ratings as well. Another way to look at it is, okay, how do they perform in the field? So me, in uh, collaboration with several other extension, area extension specialists and uh, state specialists, we do a variety of wheat and scab trials. Okay, as part of the U.S. Wheat and Barley Scab Initiative, several locations across the state. What I'm showing you is a variety trial that was done in my neck of the woods where I grew up in Sargent County, and this is on hard red winter wheat. Now, the key thing I want you to notice is these are the dawn levels, so think of the mycotoxin that is produced by the Fusarium head blight fungus at the end of the year. And how did the role of just a variety, no fungicides here, but what is the role of one variety able to, to uh, effectively reduce some of these dawn levels? So as you look here on the vertical axis, we have the dawn level in parts per million. At the bottom, we have a variety of hardwood wind reeds. And somebody sees some pretty contrasting differences, right? There, there are some that are more susceptible than others. Certainly, there's other factors that go into winter wheat variety selection. You know, winter hardiness, for example. Understand that, but it's just good to know that there are some varieties. Uh, the last couple of years, uh, Emerson and uh, Lyman seem to have quite a few lower down levels compared to some of the other varieties available. And it's good to keep in mind that when you're looking at variety susceptibility, this is this is what we're looking at for like for and head blight, for example. So we know there there are some advantages of using a certain variety depending on what type of disease that you're facing every year. The last thing I want to talk about that has somewhat of an influence with variety is your seed source. Where are you getting that seed from? And this is really geared at the seed-borne diseases that we may have. Or, in this case, I'm showing an example of some uh, non-scabby durum and heavily scabbed durum. 
This question came up a lot the last two years, and regardless if it's barley, if it's wheat, or if it's durum, if I can't market that, that grain that I pulled off because of high down levels, can I use that for seed? Okay? There, you might have received that question, or you might have thought about it. When you think of that, you think of scabby seed, if it's a high dawn seed lot, you have the Fusarium fungus present. Now the Fusarium fungus, as we saw earlier with root rots, can be a root rot organism, and it can also prevent the germination of that seed. So there's a couple things that, if you choose to use a seed source that is heavily scabbed, you want to get that germination test. You gotta figure out what is that germ test that you're dealing with, okay? Once you have that, you maybe, sometimes it can be as low as 30%, and sometimes it can be 80 to 85%. It's a good starting thing. Second is, because you're gonna have some scabby kernels that are not gonna germinate, but are gonna be a source of inoculum, a seed treatment is probably wise in this case as well. Uh, there's a variety of seed treatments out there uh, that are effective and for that short term to get that seed out of the ground. So I mean, when you think of a seed source, this is one thing that I, to, to, I, I like to use as an example, is scabby seed. Another disease we have is loose smut. Now this is a seed-borne disease. This is more common when, uh, uh, as an example, I had a grower that grew bin or had the same bin run seed for five years, and he was using the same source. On the fifth year, he told me 30, 40 percent of his field had these heads out there. Reason being, he wasn't using a seed treatment. He was eliminating one of those tools that you could use uh, for managing a seed-borne disease. But having certified seed uh, can certainly reduce the, your uh, your risk of some of these seed-borne diseases that we face. In this case. A loose smut. So that comes into example of the importance of variety selection and seed source, of how you can start preventing some of the diseases in the upcoming year, and some of the ones that are highlighted uh, as far as knowing. Okay, we have cultural methods, but before I dive into that, next question. Do you practice or do you manage at least one wheat on wheat rotation? And go ahead and answer. Okay, 69, that seems like a magic number. 78% have indicated they manage a wheat on wheat rotation. Okay, that's fine. But the thing is, because of a wheat on wheat rotation, gives you an understanding of what type of diseases <coughs> may I be dealing with. Maybe residue borne disease, right? As I mentioned, like the tan spot fungus. Why may you see more tan spot on this side of the state uh, than uh, maybe on the east side? especially in the no-till ground. So using that weed on weed rotation certainly can be done, but from a disease perspective, understanding what type of risk that you are more prone to see. First thing I want to talk about is this tan spot disease and the influence of crop rotation on it. So this, uh, this trial I uh, was part of when I was an undergraduate student with Marcia McMullen, and here we're looking at the role of what crop rotation and variety selection had on the level of severity of tan spot. Okay? So as I move through here, this axis here is going to show you the percent severity on the flag leaf. So this is the amount of area that was covered by tan spot lesion. On the bottom, we have uh, four varieties, Glen, Trooper, Steel, and Briggs. First thing I'm going to show you, this is when wheat was planted on soybean. Certainly we had some uh, disease severity on the upper leaves. Uh, this is, certainly can happen because these spores can travel by air, they can be spread around, and uh, really when uh, research plots, there's a lot of wheat residue. Uh, but right next door in the plot, when you have wheat on wheat, the level of severity goes up. Now this may, be seem, this may seem intuitive, right? You're planting wheat on wheat, you're going to see more tan spot. But it's also a good reminder that if you do plant wheat on wheat, you may see tan spot. There's other things that come into play. Certainly weather is one of them. Cool, wet weather drives this disease, and that also has to, has to be in the forefront of your mind. So when you think of this, just be aware that any type of your residue-borne diseases are going to be higher in a wheat on wheat rotation. Another residue-borne disease that I may have mentioned earlier is uh, the Fusarium fungus. It overturns on corn residue and all the small grain residue. So that's just one more disease that sits in the residue that you may have to worry about. So dealing with uh, the Fusarium fungus, and I'm showing Don data again, just because usually that is what, uh, when you take it at the end of the, end of the day, when you take it to the elevator, trying to market it, that is what you're starting to get some of your dockage from. So same line of thinking, we have two uh, rotations here, wheat on dry wheat, wheat on wheat. 
uh, the dawn level on this axis, and you have variety selection. And here I included what the, how well they do on scab. So you have some moderately resistant, some moderately susceptible, some susceptible. Now this was a low disease year. Okay, and there wasn't a lot of scab in the trials, but certainly does does show uh, what, what what we would expect to see. So we on driving uh, rotation. Notice that okay, a lot of these with some type of resistance were manageable. Uh, this one is still manageable when it comes to a, when it comes to a, a marketing the grain. Uh, it has to depend on what type of grain class. Since this is spring wheat, uh, we're going to be all right. But when you put the wheat on wheat rotation again, a trial is done right next to it. Notice that some of the resistance can hold up a little bit better in a low disease environment. But some of these uh, what I call super susceptibles, they can go up twice as high. So that's just something to keep in mind. Is when you think if you're in a wheat on wheat rotation. The type of diseases that you can be familiar with on that type of ground. Last one I'm going to talk about is virus diseases. Um, weed streak mosaic device. Who's heard of breaking the green bridge? Raise your hand on this one. Who practices breaking the green bridge? Oh, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll shoot 60%. So, who doesn't know what the breaking the green bridge means? It's okay. It's, okay, so what we're looking for is when, when you're planting winter wheat, in the fall, and you're going to be planting it into spring wheat ground, you want to have a two week period where you don't have any available green tissue. So in other words, control the volunteers from the harvest. This can be done with herbicide, uh, and the east side we do tillage, but really it's, you can adjust that uh, based on uh, trying to break this amount of period you have exposure where those mites can move on from the volunteer into the winter wheat, overwinter and become the problem for the next year, and you start seeing wheat streak mosaic virus. So an example of what not to do, uh, this, was, this was done in the fall where a grower, uh, thanks to Roger Ashley on this photo, um, he, he was planting his winter wheat into spring wheat volunteers. Notice all the green vegetation out there. Now if those mites are sitting in that spring wheat and they're carrying the virus and then that winter wheat emerges, you're probably going to be dealing with that problem in the upcoming year. So that, 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 is, that is the implication of knowing that when you put that into the ground, how you put it, that, that, that's the type of uh, risk that can affect. So I mentioned that you can control the volunteers. Seeding date can also come into play. Uh, another photo from Roger. Here we have two fields side by side. The only thing that differed is when they were planted. One was September 2nd, one was September 20th. Uh, so here you might see the visual difference about when you see some of the spare spots in the field. Well, this is wheat streak mosaic virus at work. And here I blow up the photo just to kind of show that it kind of started from a field edge and it's moving across the field. Now, the influence of the planting date across, across the section line, there's no, there's no virus yet. And the re reason I say yet is, depending on what happened in that other field, uh, those mites may move, they may not move. It really depends on how well they overwinter. So, planting date comes into play when it comes to managing wheat streak mosaic virus. Certainly, pushing it towards the end of that window where you're comfortable that it's going to survive is going to help you with wheat streak mosaic virus. Okay, so let's move on to fungicides. This is uh, probably where the, the heart of the presentation is going to be sitting on today. As I'm, I'm going to try to touch on just about uh, any time we use fungicides, especially out in Western North Dakota. So the first thing I always like, I always like think it from when you put it into the ground to when you harvest it, is the influence of fungicide seed treatments. So here's another audience poll question. When deciding on using a fungicide seed treatment, do you always treat the seed? Consider the risk factors. Maybe it's a cool wet, or you're on a weed on wheat, or you've just been dealing with root rot problems. You never use one, or some other thing I probably didn't describe up there that you may be looking at. So go ahead and respond at any time. Okay. <laughs> Always treat C. Okay. Regardless of the year, it's always true to see. I should ask a follow-up question. Is this going to change at all with the, in the upcoming year uh, with input prices? May or may not. Uh, some of the seed treatments you can get relatively inexpensive depending on what you put on there or type of package that you use. Uh, so when you're using that seed treatment, most of the time you probably have faced root rots in the problem. Maybe you've had some stand loss issues. Uh, certainly in wheat on wheat rotation, uh, you're at a higher risk for root rots. If you use bin run seed, you have a higher risk for seed borne diseases. So all that kind of comes into play why you may or may not choose uh, to have a, a fungicide on, on your wheat ground. 
But we also look at this from a research standpoint. So this first little piano chart that I'm showing you is the Harvard Spring Week seed treatment trials that are done at NDSU. Some of these were done by Roger, uh, my predecessor, Marsha, and I've continued this into uh, to my tenure so far at NDSU. And what we're looking at is the relative yield difference from the non-treated. So think of something that was naked seed, just putting the raw seed out there, no other treatment, but also had either, uh, either had a non added or not. And what I want you to, to look at is the type of responses here. So the first thing we may be seeing is that across these 30 trials from 2003 to 2014, variability. I see that a lot with seed treatments. It's not such a, always a consistent response. Sometimes with a foliar fungicide, you may see more of a consistent response because you're able to cover that flag leaf or cover some of those new leaves with the fungicide and you're reducing your disease. But what does this look like on average? Well, across the state, from eastern North Dakota to western North Dakota, look at about a 4.3% increase based off non-treated seed. Now, the other thing you have to keep in mind is, yes, this does show an overall positive increase, but you also run that risk of you don't always see that, right? That's, that, that's, a, that's some of the things. So when it comes to making that seed treatment decision, uh, certainly considering those risk factors are going to come into play. Um, more part of cool, wet ground, bin run seed, maybe your seed source, right? That, that's, those are the things you uh, all kind of come into play uh, and probably you have because you come into play in making a decision on seed treatment trials. So I condensed the data set and just moved it to the southwest North Dakota. Uh, these trials are done anywhere Dickinson down, down to the Mott Regent area. And same type of trend. You see some highs, you see some lows. So what, are, what, are, what does our average look like? Uh, it didn't move a whole lot, right? It's about the same. Um, certainly at some point I'd like to run all the statistics on this to generate almost like a probability of seeing this response. I'm not quite there yet. Still, still getting the data all transformed and um, making, it, making it available to see them and give a more clear-cut message. But this is something that we're going to continue to do at NDSU is really look at these seed treatments across these trials. And maybe Ryan up here, he's, he's taking a lot of notes. He's going to be, he's going to be uh, you know, calling me to make sure he does some seed treatment trials as well. So. Okay, so that's kind of the seed treatment story. That's what we've seen in the last couple of years. But now let's look at some of the fungicide applications that happen in season. Uh, so the three most common times a fungicide is put on during the season is that tillering or that herbicide application, four to six leaves. Uh, it can be done on flag leaf depending on the year, right? Uh, certainly it depends on what diseases are present and whether or not you may have used one at early tillering. And probably one that is the one question I get most often is early flowering. In other words, known as the scab application. Should I spray for weed scab? Always, a, always kind of a guessing game. There's no... Uh, fine-tuned science to that. So as a general rule of thumb, when I think of foliar fungicides and how they're used, is, this is kind of my, kind of what goes through my thought process. So if anybody in here would give me a call next summer, uh, in the late part of June, I'm going to probably ask what the variety is. What type of crop rotation are you under? Have you been out there scouting? And by, by scouting, uh, it means from it, do you see foliar diseases present in the under canopy? And what, more importantly, you have to become your own weatherman. Now I'm giving you more jobs, right, but I, I, I understand that. But it's just something that I go through. And finally, what type of diseases have you identified already? Okay, all those come into play when you're thinking about that foliar fungicide application. It's, I, wish, I wish, you know, sometimes you may just say, well, I'm just going to spray regardless. Doesn't matter, I'm not going to worry about it, it's my insurance application. And I, and I understand that. that, that's wrong. But when you, if you ever give me a call about a foliar fungicide, uh, on, the, on the leaves, these are the type of things that I'm going to be asking you. So when I look at the tearing application, so what I like doing is always combining these large trial sets to kind of give a message is how, you know, how worthwhile is a tearing application and especially the type of rotation that you have. Uh, so some of you might have seen this down in Hedinger, uh, but this is a great trial done in 2000 by Roger. Um, here we're looking at three different crop rotation schemes. So wheat was planted on this type of crop rotation. And the relative yield when it was left non-treated or when tilt was used at a two ounce rate. Okay, so it's a pretty popular fungicide used early on because of its relative expense. So let's go step by step. The wheat on wheat on barley, planting wheat in the wheat, high risk situation. All these, all these uh, research sites had, had, uh, had rain early in May. 
and they're all cool. So you had the development of tan, tan spot, potential development of tan spot. And almost with just a Chilean application, you saw a yield bump. And a lot of this was resulted because you're able to kind of set back that tan spot disease from moving up the canopy and taking those flag leaves and resulting in some of your prime yield reductions. Similar trial here, another weed on weed type of rotation, a little bit lower yield, but the same trend is seeing that if you're planting in a high risk environment, this is probably is going to be paying for that, for that early season application. But what about the influence of crop rotation? What if you put weed in the sunflower? Maybe you put wheat in the legume. You're probably going to see the same trend. That trailing application may not show you so much. Why? Disease may not be there yet. Okay? It may not be the best time to pull the trigger on that fungicide. So when it comes to that fungicide, notice how I just use your crop rotation to make your decision. Right? What are you going to be dealing with? And based off of who practices or manages wheat on wheat, this is something that will be uh, pretty useful, whether if you want to justify that early season application. So what happens when the weather is not conducive? I'm pulling the data from seven trials that I did this year, in, uh, from, I'm sorry, last year that I did in Fargo. All these were applied at the four to six leaf stage, and I'm just going to break it down by chemistry to chemistry. So here you have the yield of all these, uh, I think it's eight treatments here. You have the non-treated, uh, you have Paraxer, Tilt, Stratego, Quilt, a couple of rates of Corumba, and Approach Primo. What are, what are we seeing? Okay. So the purple bar here is what the non-treated control is. You saw some that are a little bit better, some that are not worse. Certainly if you see a, that four, uh, four to five bushel increase, that's still not statistically significant. There's too much variation in the data. There's no consistent trend, in other words. There might have been a really high yielding plot, or there might have been a really low yielding plot for some of these. And that's something always to keep in mind with some of these plots, but the key thing to remember is, we didn't have that consistent yield response when you're in a low disease environment. And when you're in that low disease environment, and all this is planted on soybean residue, I think we kind of see what the trend is doing right now. So what about the flag leaf application? Well, oftentimes a flag leaf application is always talked about if it's going to be a rust year. And if there's going to be an input cost that is going to be foregone, and what I foresee next year is going to be a flag leaf application. Um, so this past year, I'm going to show you when a flag leaf application is worthwhile. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we had a stripe rust epidemic on the east side, and then my plots were no exception to that. So I had seven trials that I combined, and here I'm just looking at three uh, fungicide timings. One is a non-treated, one is that earlier tillering, and one is that flag leaf. So what did we see between the non-treated and tillering? Really not much of a yield difference when you just put it between those two two types of uh, fungicide regimes. Why? When you put that tearing application, you're protecting those leaves that are available at that point. Our fungicides do not go fully systemic. So any new leaves that come out after that application are going to be susceptible to some of, the, some of the pathogens that are going to fall on the leaves. Okay? And if you remember, where do rust diseases come from? Are they residue borne or are they blowing up from the south? They're blowing up from the south, right? So at this time, you're not getting much, you're not getting much, uh, you know, kind of pushback on that disease. But when you look at the yield response in that flag leaf, here we jump nine to ten bushels. Reason being, that was the time when the flag leaf is out, uh, the most important leaf of the wheat crop, and you're able to protect it from a rust. So in a bad rust year, yes, a flag leaf application is worthwhile. But how do we know it's going to be a bad rust year, right? So go back to your basics. Be out there scouting. Look out some of the reports that are sent out by your local extension office. Talk to your agronomy professionals. All that comes into play is, so am I going to see stripe rust? And then finally, look at your variety susceptibility. If you had a resistant variety to stripe rust in this case, you're not going to see a big yield boost because you already have that one tool that's able to manage that effectively in a disease perspective. So, based on what you saw from the tilling application, what you saw from the flag leaf application, I want you to answer this question. When, I, when deciding on applying a foliar fungicide next year, and don't, don't think so much uh, about economics, but will you scout, kind of bring everything in, and make your decision, spray at tillering regardless, spray at flag leaf regardless, make two applications at tillering and flag leaf, or you know what, times are tough, I'm just not going to use fungicides at all for my foliar.
What is the audience going to do here? Oh, my goodness. I think, I, think I think somebody should take a photo. This means I'm making an impact, or it's just because, <laughs> yes, Andrew, we know what we're doing already. We're just here to get the CCA credits. It's OK. <laughs> no, this is great to see, because obviously when it comes to fungicide applications, it's not the easy button. There's a lot of things that go into it. And certainly being aware of all the decisions that go into a fungicide application, both on disease, on the variety, maybe market price, that all can be helped push forward with when you use a scout-based type of approach. Last thing to talk about, Fresarian head blight, weed scab. Here, here's the condensed version, here's the shortened version, and I'll expand on this. When it comes to Fresarian head blight applications, one, we only have one fungicide chemistry, triazoles, only use triazoles. So what are triazoles? That's your Prosaro, your Corumba, full of care and all the generics. Those are the type of chemistry. That's the only thing that will offer some suppression. No, it's a good suppression and does not get rid of Fresarium head blight. Second thing, do not use strobularins in Fresarium head blight management. Strobularins, your headlines, your quadrices, even using the quilt Excel, which has two modes of action, is not recommended. The reason why is in some cases, if you just put a strobularian type of fungicide on the head, it may actually increase the down levels. So if there's anything, if you're trying to make a decision for a fusarium head blight, focus it on triazoles only. So once you have the right fungicide, when is the best time to apply it? Um, my, my predecessor for years, and it's been heavily researched, the best time to apply is early flowering. Okay, yes, I, I know the next question is, how do I know my whole field is early flowering? You, I know as well as everybody else that field variability comes into play. So my little caveat on this is, I define early flowering as when you start seeing some of those yellow petals coming out in the middle of the head, that's, that's when you should be getting ready to spray that. And when you see that in the majority of the field, you're not going to have the 100% perfect time to do it, but do it with majority and when you have some of those yellow flowers. And then the next question is, okay, uh, maybe you want to use a pilot, but the pilot's not going to get there for a couple days. Is it better to be too early or too late? The last three, four years, uh, some of the research that I've been doing, and a lot of the research has been uh, done across the U.S., uh, we're starting to see that our, our window is better on the back end than it is on being too early. Um, that's, that's what we're seeing right now. There's a couple things that may come into play. One is the conducive environment that may be seen towards the end of uh, the grain filling stages, which promotes the uh, fusarium to colonize the head. There's a certain, there's a lot of ways to do this, but right now what we're trying to see is if, if you can't make it at early flowering, what you perceive to be early flowering, being out there a little bit later is going to be better. So how do we decide to make making a fusarium headlight application? I always say there's always that gut instinct. There are certainly several growers out here that have face scab in the past that they know when they're not feeling too comfortable about, you know, about scab being a problem this year. So what is a scab year? Is, you only think of it as when it's heading out and when it's flowering. If you see warm weather, and I say warm 75, 85 degrees, high dew points or high moisture retention, those things kind of kind of dispel to me like, okay, we, we might have a scab year coming on. Okay, another way we can do it is we can forecast it. Uh, there are, there's two models that you can use for scab forecasting. We have one at NDSU. The small grain forecasting website uh, does give you a scab risk assessment based on what variety you're growing and what part of the state. It's the same thing as you know, green, yellow, red. But we also have this national model. And where this is different, it gives you a predictive sense. It looks three days in advance as well. So to use this, I always have some kind of tidbit of what I'm seeing, what the wheat crop is doing, so maybe usually you'll start seeing this pick up a lot for comments for me is when you have, uh, when wheat is starting to head out and starting to flower, I can almost always guarantee every year, late June, and I do not have a 4th of July. That's always scab season for me. Uh, there's my window. So that, that's probably the best time to look at scab rest if you're looking at it across the state. But you select the variety uh, based on susceptible of spring. In this case, I have a susceptible spring rate variety. At today's date, which was a 622 this past year, and look at the scab risk across the state. I know Hedinger had some winter wheat flowering at this time, and they had some high scab levels and high down levels. Okay, now you can select 24, 48, and 72 hours in advance, and based on predictive weather elements, 
it's going to change this map slightly. Okay. Same thing if you would switch the variety, your risk is going to is going to fluctuate as well. So this is a good tool just in case you're worried that your gut instinct isn't telling you the right information. Okay. So how does this work in a common sense? So go, going back to this past year, uh, doing these wheat and barley scab trials that we conduct across the state. Here I'm pulling a uh, Durham uh, variety by fungicide timing trial that was done up in Langdon, uh, North Dakota. Um, so here we have scab severity, so the amount of heads that have, uh, have you know, bleach spikelets, the premature senescing on three Durham varieties, Divide, Carpio, Montreal, and there's three fungicide programs, non-treated, the ideal time early flowering, and then five days past early flowering. So first thing, we're going to look at the non-treated. So Divide and Carpio, uh, kind of Divide is still probably our best uh, scab uh, resistant variety that we have. Certainly it's not 100%. And if I had to compare it to Harvard spring wheat, I think it's about a moderately susceptible if you compare it to it in a spring, spring wheat scale. Uh, Carpio is close, depends on the year and everything. But Montreal, as I know, is a susceptible variety to scab. So in a non-traded, in this scab type of environment, you see the role of some of the uh, variety resistance have on the disease. So when you add a fungicide, Notice how much more it goes down. Um, on average, when you apply a fungicide, and this is at this one, this one uh, was Prosaro at six and a half ounce use rate, uh, you can you can expect somewhere in the neighborhood, on average, about forty-five to fifty percent. That goes with Corumba as well. Um, those two products are the most efficacious. Uh, if you look at forward here in terms of on average suppression of scab that's when you start uh, falling into that 30% range. So there is some variability uh, in the, amongst those triazoles, and that's something to keep in mind. But if you look at this timing one more day, notice that, that the level of scab uh, of, has been reduced again, even if you put that single application five days later. So that's what I'm talking about, your window of, of spraying for scab, maybe a little bit more on the back side. Now, we didn't do anything on the early side, which certainly would have helped support this data, uh, but that's something that we're looking at next year. And we also are looking into uh, some of the questions I get for SCAB is what if I make two applications, a half rate of uh, Corumba at early flowering and another half rate coming back later on. Right now when I look at all the data, um, it's no different than one, you know, one well-timed application at early flowering. That's kind of what we say as far as efficacy. So next time to SCAB, we don't have a silver bullet, but we do have some varieties. We do have some, we do have some fungicides. And, and, and in that case, that's your best way to manage scab. So to wrap things up, I think you kind of see that we have several management tools. You just have to you know, go back into that toolbox and see what you're going to use this year. Integrate as many as you can. Certainly, there's sometimes you may have two or three options to help suppress a disease. I often say don't rely just on a single management tool. Um, in the long run, that's probably your best choice. Certainly, there's some diseases where you only have one management tool. And, I thought to keep in mind, as soon as you put that seed in the ground next year, that's when you start thinking of disease management. You know, start, start being that lead horse in that horse race, right? You're trying to stay ahead of it, trying to figure out what's going on. So with that, leave you, send, leave you off with a picture of the dome, and uh, please, I'll entertain any questions at this time.